Good evening and welcome to tonight's Policy Peace and Pine. My name is Robert Ermel and I'm the Director of Operations for the Manitoba Institute for Policy Research. To find out more about our institute and what we do, I invite you to check out the papers on your table and go to our website at www.mipr.ca. Manitoba is known for its vibrant arts and culture scene. From our galleries, museums and clubs, to events such as the Winnipeg International Jazz Festival, the Winnipeg Folk Festival, the Festival of Voyager, and the many small and large community festivals and events across the province. We know that cultural industries play a big role in the lives of Manitoba. But what do we mean by cultural industries? How do cultural industries impact our economy? How are industries supported and what might be done? How can we integrate arts and culture and public policy in order to improve our communities? Our panel this evening will answer these questions and more. Our moderator this evening is Dr. Shannon Snapper, Perspectives and Pol Politics Editor at the Winnipeg Free Press. And our panel, <laughs> our panel tonight is Alan, we have Alan Freeman, author of The Irresistible Economics of Art for All, which is available here at the front. Uh, Mr. Thomas Sparling, Executive Director of the Arts and Cultural Industries Association of Manitoba. And Ms. Lynn Skrmita. Skrmita. <laughs> Executive Director of the Winnipeg Folk Festival. Their details are pleased to be found in your welcome papers. Following tonight's event, I invite you to fill out your feedback forms. Many of your, many of our event ideas come from your feedback. I'll now pass the mic over to Shannon and get us started for tonight. Enjoy. I was hoping I could do this better uh, on a wonderful warm afternoon of talking about art and culture in Manitoba. So the deal will be five minutes. I have my book. I won't turn and I won't be, but don't go longer than you know, five, ten minutes. Um, and then uh, we'll open it uh, to back to you for discussion. I'll be able to discuss uh, some of the ideas that you raise, and then we'll open it on the floor for questions from the people on the floor. Uh, and I believe you said that Ellen and Tom, and then Lynn, uh, there's the order in which we'll go. So we'll start first with uh, Ellen and uh, his uh, overview. Uh, let me just see what the title is here officially. Um, but you're going to talk to me about, oh, good have yeah, title. Uh, we're going to talk, we're going to talk basically about a larger picture of uh, arts in, in Manitoba. Or you would start with me. I'm going to talk outside the box. <laughs> so thanks to the organizers and my fellow speakers, this is going to be a great dialogue. Um, the club, I can see on the mic, to put the mic next to my mouth. And the co-director is Radhika Desai, who uh, gives her address, she can't be here. of a new think tank at the University of Manitoba called the Geopolitical Economy Research Group. And we've got some posters, there's one on each table, take a look. And it's very related to what I'm going to talk about, which is outside the box. Why outside the box? Because the box is the problem. I'm going to talk about creativity. Specifically, the creative economy, and the core of that is the creative industries, and it's fueled by creative jobs. And I've got my one and only picture up there, which is a great thing. It's um, graphs going up, which everybody loves. <laughs> I'm going to tell you what is going up and why. Uh, people in this field can get very creative with numbers. Now, I'm going to talk about data that comes from the UK Ministry of Culture and its statistics are well respected worldwide. They were overhauled in 2014. I was part of the research team because I did this work initially with the Mayor of London, England. And I would say, of course I would, that they're the best they are. <laughs> they cover 16 years and that makes it a trend, not a cycle, not a flash in the pan. That's the first important thing. The second thing is the method that's used to construct, and I'll say a little bit about that, because one of the things I very much think that uh, Canada and the US have to do is, is, is use this method and apply it here so we have a comparable standard. So the bottom orange line, you don't need to look, but I'll tell you it's orange, don't know what that means, is um, the UK economy as a whole. Now, over 16 years, it grew by 10.6%. That's basically lower than demographic demographic growth. So that, that, this is a stagnant economy. So what about the creative economy? Well, there are, first of all, it's big. There are 1,700,000 people working in it. That's about 6% of the UK workforce. To give you a feel, it's bigger than construction, it's bigger than manufacturing, it's much bigger than finance. And it's growing faster, so by 2030, I calculate it's actually going to be bigger than all three of these industries put together. So we're not talking about, you know, a little sideshow here. It's got two parts. The first is called creative industries. 
Now they produce what are called high-end products, but they're not what are thought of, for example, as scientific or high-tech products. They don't include pharmaceuticals or aerospace. These things are important, and we've done another report on them, but I'm talking about aesthetic products. These include art, visual and performing, the digital industries, so that's film, video, recording, broadcasting, but also art, architect, sorry, architecture, fashion, advertising and software production, particularly web and game design. We don't include things like cars and furniture because it knows the function is more important than the aesthetic content, although the content is important and that's something you've got to look out for because one of our conclusions is that's increasing in all areas of production. Now, why is this definition so strict? It's to make sure there's no hype involved. So that's part of what makes it reliable and usable as an instrument of economic analysis. It's got a logic. These are the industries that use creative labor. Now, creative labor is labor that can't be replaced by a machine or made to perform mechanically in a repeated assembly line way. Now, that engages the creative capacity that's present in all human beings, but which routine jobs don't make use of. A creative industry is one in which 30% or more of the workforce is creative. That's to say, basically, its main career, its main resource, in the sense that you know, mining uses the ground and agriculture uses the land, and see, its main resource is human. A particular type of human capacity which is underdeveloped in most other jobs and now needs to be developed. And here's where we get to the policy aspect. Now, the most interesting figure, the next one, up is the creative economy as a whole. That's got two components, the creative industries I just defined, plus what are called embedded creative labor. That's work done outside the creative industries. So it would include car designers, but not mechanics. That's grown by 44%, that's around 2.5 a year. It actually went up in 2008, you can probably see that just from the you know, visuals there, when nearly everything else fell. Then it gets interesting. Inside that economy, the creative industries themselves, that's the nine industries I just described, went up by 83%. That's nearly 4% a year. It's getting close to the growth levels the UK economy hasn't seen since the 50s. And then within that, we get this critical resource, creative, artistic, labor. And that's the key economic resource, and it's grown by 138% in 16 years. That's near to 6%. Now, this is gold rush territory. If Winnipeg can grow that fast, its workforce would double every 12 years. Election candidates take note. These are jobs. That's the bottom line of any sensible economic policy, because they create livelihoods. But they are jobs with extras. They create wealth, because the products are high value added. They create well-being, because people enjoy them. And the people who work in these industries, if they're well treated, which is not always the case, also enjoy them. Simply stated, what is this sector doing? It's creating a mass market for artistic products. That's what's going on. Now, how do we invest in it? If you look at the assets that you need, Manitoba has got them in space. It's got a terrific creative workforce. It's home to one of the fastest growing trends in the world, which is Aboriginal art and art trends in the world, and it's got Winnipeg's creative quarters, the exchange district, and these are assets which make cities like Sheffield and Manchester, they, they showed out billions to try and create, and we've got it free, we're sitting in it, right? And the software and IT sector is up to par, it's not as good as it could be, but basically we have all the elements that are needed. What's missing is how we harness that, and that needs policy. In particular, it needs government to invest in it. And I'm going to come back, if I get time, to what investment means, because it's not the same as shelling out for the begging bowl, which is why we have to get outside that box. It has to support artistic talent, it has to support programs like Sistema or Art City that ensure all our citizens get to realize their talent. It has to support the public anchors, like the opera, the orchestra, the ballet, and Winnipeg brands' reputation as the creative heart of Canada. So how does that relate to culture? Now let's just check how the time frame. Uh, you're doing just fun. Okay, that's where the box comes in when we get to culture. We live in a society that treats public culture as a poor cousin. 
but it also treats mass commercial art as a second class activity. So it's a perfect storm of neglect. On the one hand, public culture is badged as a luxury. It's consumed by elites. So it then goes up the begging bowl to get stuff that only rich people want. That's not a good offer. Then you find, it's, what you get is what's left after you pay for the snow plows. That's what you get for being a luxury. But then you don't provide for the necessity that every citizen has to develop their creative capacity. And we know that exists in everybody. Just think about jazz. That's, culture comes from, some of the finest comes from, the finest culture we have, comes from the poorest sections of society. That's not realized if it's an alien inside the box thing. So that's always been wrong ethically, but I'm telling you now it's wrong economically. The new mass markets are being carried by a revolution in the productivity of delivering services. And that's the electronic digital ICT revolution. And that's doing for services and art what the Model T Ford did for cars. So it, aesthetics are its driving force. The creative industries are actually the Model T of the new world. It might or might not happen, depending on policies, be a new world of art, of universal culture. Now, don't get me wrong, commerce is not the point of culture, and it's not a substitute for it. You can't, but you can't have a car industry without roads, and you can't have a creative economy without creative people and a creative infrastructure. Can we afford it? Oh, we have to pony up. Why do we have to pony up? Because if we don't, we'll end up like Detroit. Which, according to this wonderful book, which I recommend every politician in Manitoba to buy, I personally bought five copies. I know there's more politicians than that, but they can afford it. <laughs> and it shows that you lost more jobs in Detroit through deindustrialization than New Orleans lost through Katrina. And we'll end up like that if we don't take policies that put investment in the assets that we have and realize them. But because it's an investment, you can afford it. First of all, it comes from a different budget. You don't use the bit that's left over for the snow plows to pay for investments. You use new stuff that's going to get a return. So it does get a return. Where does that return from? And here's the come from. That's the problem. It's realized exter what we economists call externally. It's realized in the businesses that come here, in the tourists who come here, in the industry you attract, because this is a creative place where they can find that workforce. The workforce itself is poor as church mice. But if you don't support them, you don't get industries. So you need very creative thinking about how to get those streams of future income into the investment budget. And actually, a lot of thinking has been done about that, but you've got to bring in the finance guys, the VC guys, and the government in order to make that happen together with business. So, last thing. The issue is not whether we can afford to do it, but whether we can afford not to. I've already mentioned Detroit and Katrina. But the crucial point that's difficult is this one. This is the really the nub of the whole thing. Cultural investments are public service. This is the idea I coined in the opinion piece I put in during the election, which CDC put on their website. It's a new way of thinking. A public service is something that everybody has to have. It's for everybody, not just for some people. And just like you can't make a side street pay for itself, you can't expect an artist or a teacher or an orchestra to pay for itself. They'll do well, especially in the future part of their lives, so you'll get a return on it, but not straight away. So that public service will make money for the public, it will pay for itself, and it will satisfy that basic, most human need of all, to make and enjoy great art, great music, and great culture. Thank you very much.